We're going to be looking in 1 Kings 19. If you would like to follow me in your Bible, 1 Kings 19. We're going to talk again about Elijah, but you can see on the screen what we're going to look at. In fact, let me tell you this. It's interesting to me that in the Bible, you have recorded again and again the failures of Christian men and women. Not only their successes are told in detail, but their failures are written about as well. And some of them are a bit ugly. Howard Hendricks, a uh, great professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, he writes about this and he says to him, this proves two things. First, he writes, this proves to me that God wrote the book and not man because man always whitewashes his failures. God paints man warts and all. He's got a point. If you were writing your story, if I were writing my story, we would carefully omit those things that are not very flattering to us. That's the way it is. That's human nature. Secondly, he goes on to say, the recorded failures of biblical men and women prove to us that the God who wrote these stories is a God of grace who wants us to profit from these recorded events. And so he preserves these stories just as they actually happened in order to give us a strong warning of potential danger. There's an old saying, experience is the best teacher but it doesn't have to be your own. The point is we can learn from the experiences of others. And if we will learn, if we're smart, we're going to spare ourselves a lot of pain, a lot of hardship, a lot of sorrow by doing that. Now, to move this in another direction, I want us to keep in mind what the New Testament has to say about Elijah the prophet. In James 5 verse 17, James writes, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He was a human being and he possessed a fully human nature. He wasn't different or uh, made different than we are. He was a human person like all of us. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Now those two verses actually encapsulate what we've already learned from uh, the story here of Elijah. I'm talking about my two previous messages on this uh, character, Elijah. For example, to go back to uh, 1 Kings 17, chapter 17, that's where Elijah prays that it won't rain. And it doesn't. And if you remember, God was using that dry season, that drought, in order to send a message to his people. God was saying, look, I'm not going to bless you as long as you're living the way that you are. Don't expect me to honor you the way that you're living, in sin, in rebellion. God was using the drought to get their attention. In chapter 18, what we saw there, and this was two weeks ago, we saw the great showdown between Elijah and the 750 prophets of Baal. They were gathered together, uh, a lot of people. On one side, you had uh, the prophets of Baal, 750 strong, and Elijah. They would each lay out a, a carefully crafted sacrifice to be given to their gods. So the prophets of Baal did what they were called to do, and they made their sacrifice, and then they began to cry out to Baal. Who's a myth? 
But there's a demon contact context to that at any rate. So they're crying out, rain, rain, Baal, answer by fire and consume this sacrifice. Baal, Baal. And they, were, they went crazy. And Elijah, you remember, began to mock them. And then at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, after hours of that, Elijah said, all right, it's my turn. And he prays a prayer, and this is it. Verse 37, 1 Kings 18, he says, Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their heart back again. Then <clears throat> the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. Look at this. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And so here is Elijah at this point. He has an incredible victory. And you would think based on this demonstration of God's power, you would think that this event alone would put a stake in the heart of Baalism in the northern kingdom of Israel. That's what Elijah thought. And so as you read on in this chapter, chapter 18, verse 44, after this great event, he tells his servant, I want you to go up and say to Ahab. Now remember, Ahab... Ahab is the king of Israel. He has been involving himself in Baalism. He has been like an evangelist of Baalism. He's married to that woman Jezebel that I'll talk about in just a couple of moments. So Elijah now says, uh, believing that Ahab is pretty stunned, and he is, he says, now you go say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down so that the heavy shower does not stop you. Now, it hasn't started raining yet. But verse 45 says, In a little while, while the sky drew black, grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a heavy shower, and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And so notice the rain is coming down, and here is King Ahab and Elijah they are rushing to the city of Jezreel, which I would add is approximately 17 miles away from where they are located at Mount Carmel. The reason they are going to Jezreel is to confront Jezebel with what had just happened. Jezebel, remember, is a fully devoted servant, worshiper, evangelist of Baal of Baalism. Her very name is a commemoration to the god Baal. Jezebel. Her father, uh, his name was Ethibael. I mean, these, these people are enmeshed into this whole idea of Baalism. So here is Ahab, and here is Elijah, and they're on their way to Jezreel, to see Jezebel. Now the thing to understand is that Ahab, he has it in his mind that after the events have taken place on Mount Carmel, he has it in, in his mind that, that Israel is back to God. And he's going to make a great statement. And this mighty demonstration is going to prove to be the, the one thing that turns everyone back to God. So he's thinking revival has come. Revival is on the way. So he's pumped. In fact, look at this in verse 46. Let me get it back here. Uh, here's what happens. Then the Lord gave special strength to Elijah. He tucked his cloak under his belt. That is his kind of a flowing robe thing. And he ran ahead of Ahab's chariot all the way to the entrance of Jezreel. So after, after that experience on Mount Carmel, here he is running 17 miles ahead of this chariot. You can tell he's, he's fully adrenalized, man. He is, he is just so full of excitement and joy. And he's going to go confront 
Jezebel, thinking that she's going she's gonna to understand that God is the Lord and there's going to be repentance everywhere. But in chapter 19, verse 1, let's look at what happens. Oh, by the way, you can imagine also that Jezebel is also pretty excited because she doesn't know what happened on Mount Carmel. And she is a worshiper of Baal. Now remember, Baal is the god of the rain. He's the god of the storm. He's the god of lightning. That's, that's the way they had placed him in their mythology. So she, being a, a worshiper of Baal, takes note of the fact that it's raining outside. Baal has come through. But then she gets the real story. Look at this, verse 1. When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done. Told him the whole story, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. They put to death the messengers of Baal. It was a capital crime what they were doing, and they took care of them. Now, you would think this would make an impression on Jezebel, but it doesn't. Look at verse 2. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. That's not what he expected to hear. Look at this. Elijah was afraid. And fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Beersheba was about 70 miles from Jezreel, the city where they were meeting Jezebel. Look at verse 4. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree or juniper tree and he prayed that he might die I have had enough Lord he said take my life for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died now that last line there that I've darkened and underlined is a very revealing statement and I say that because this fear that is in Elijah I'm not so certain that it's uh, exclusively because of Jezebel. Uh, she all, she's factoring into this, no doubt. But I think what he's really afraid of, deep in his heart, the root of his fear is being viewed as a failure. Being viewed as ineffective, as unable to come through, unable to get the job done. And as you can see, all of this is feeding now into his sense of self-pity. By the way, this particular fear that I'm talking about, I see a lot of it today. And I've learned that this is what keeps a lot of Christians on the sidelines of, of the life that God calls them to. And, and you will find these are people who will never step out and take a faith risk because they're so afraid of failure. So afraid of being seen by others in a certain way. Being seen by others as unable, ineffective. And because of that fear, they never step out and take a risk in faith. I think this fear is truly infecting a lot of Christians uh, everywhere today. This, this fear of failure. Now, another thing that obviously contributes to this uh, despondency in Elijah is that for the first time in his whole story, he gets his eyes off of God. God is now not filling out the vision of Elijah. God is not in his vision. And so he gets his eyes off 
of God and then on to the circumstances that he's confronted with. And of course, Jezebel is a central figure in these circumstances. She says, look, because of what you've done, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to get you. You, you. you need to know you're on... Uh, <laughs> you're, you're going down. I'm going to put this contract out on you and you're going to be killed. And Elijah runs. He takes off because of fear. You know, when I read this the other day, it occurred to me this sounds so incongruent. It sounds so out of character because here was Elijah just a few days earlier standing before 750 prophets of Baal filled with courage, filled with uh, uh, desire for God, filled with, with praise and filled with courage. And here he is running from this vampire, this, you know what I mean by that, this is not a real vampire, but this woman by the name of Jezebel. And he's running. And you have to ask, why does this happen? And the answer is, because God is not in his vision. All he is seeing are the external circumstances, the external threat that he's confronted with, and his own personal sense of failure. And before us, we can see him wilting away like a flower. When God was filling all of his vision, he was filled with courage. When he lost sight of who God is and what God was doing, he was gripped by this terrible fear that we can see so clearly. I, I want to ask you a question. I wonder about the vision of your life. Does God fill it? Is God filling out your vision? Or is your vision full of self? Or is it full of things? Or is it full of whatever. As Christian men and women, the secret to living the Christian way of life is to see God in all of our vision of, of life. I'll talk more about that in, in a little bit. Now, let me take you to verse 5 and following. It says, then he, meaning Elijah, lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. An angel touched him. Uh, one of the things that you're going to be amazed of when you get to heaven someday, and you will if you know the Lord, you will look back somehow on your life perhaps and see the many times that there was angelic inter in intervention in your life. You don't see it necessarily, although it does say in Hebrews 13, 5, be careful because you may entertain an angel. I mean, that, that's told. But it's probably, it's probably an invisible sense. You don't realize it, but there is angelic support for the people of God. Hebrews 1, 14 says that angels, their role and their job is to minister to those of us who are the heirs of eternal salvation. Now, the angel touches him, tells him to get up and eat. He looked around and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again. Now, I'm, the presumption here is, or the assumption here is that Time has gone by. And then the angel comes again, touched him and said, get up and eat some more or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank and the food gave him enough strength to travel to, to, to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now this place called Horeb is also the place known as Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is the place of revelation. Moses went to Sinai. 40 days and 40 nights he spent 
with God. And God revealed himself. In Exodus 33, uh, God revealed himself to Moses. So that's where Elijah is at. He journeys for this period to this place called Horeb. Verse 9 says this. Then he came there to a cave where he spent the night. There he came to a cave. Now, it's interesting. Uh, those scholars who work a lot with language, the Hebrew language, they say that it should actually read here that he came to the cave or the cave. In other words, it's just not a cave in general, but it's a specific cave that he came to. And most scholars believe, and I'm certainly uh, in agreement, that the cave where he went to was that cave where Moses was in Exodus 33, where Moses appealed to God, let me see you, let me know you, and God said, you can't look at me because you will die if you do, but I will show you something of my hinder parts, it says. I will reveal to you something of my glory, and he passes by. Now that's, the point is, that's where Elijah is, in that location, that place of revelation. So he came to a cave where he spent the night, but the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? In other words, let's understand something, Elijah. You are in this place that you're at. It's your own doing. I have not led you. I have not directed you to be at this particular location. And so God says, Elijah, what are you doing here? By the way, the questions of God in the Bible are always very important. Remember in Genesis chapter 3, after the fall of man, Adam and Eve, and they go hide, and what happens? God shows up and says, Adam, where are you? By the way, this is a little story that came to my mind. I, in my old church in Monongahela, when we were there, I have a little nephew by the name of Adam. And he fell asleep on the front pew one, one morning. And I was preaching in Genesis 3. And I said, Adam, where are you? And he jumped up and he said, <laughs> scared him to death. <clears throat> God knew where Adam was. But he wanted Adam to, to express that he knows and that he understands what's happening. Confession is good for the soul. Now look at verse, at verse uh, 10. Elijah replied. It's interesting. God says, what are you doing here? And he doesn't answer the question. He voices his complaint. He said, I've zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken down their covenant with you torn down your altars and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left and now they are trying to kill me too. I think you can see that this man is in a place of true depression at this point, spiritual depression. And by the way, I, I want to make a distinction at this point between spiritual depression and depression that has a physical, biological root. I think there is a real difference. There is some depression that has to do with, uh, with your chemistry. And sometimes that gets out of whack and you need in that case to see a physician, a doctor who can help you. Now pray, of course, always pray about everything. But that's not the depression I'm talking about. This is more spiritual in nature. It's a spiritual depression because one is confused and not understanding what God is doing in their life and there's anger here, etc. That's where Elijah is at. Look at verse 11. So God speaks. He says, go out and stand before me on the mountain. The Lord told him, 
And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by. And a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. In the King James, it says, there was a still small voice. And God was in the still small voice. Notice how it impacted Elijah. It, it spoke to him somehow because verse 13, when Elijah heard it, <clears throat> he wrapped his face in his cloak and he went out and stood at the entrance of the, of the cave. He replied again, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty. But the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Then the Lord told him, Go back the same way you came, and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Haziel to be king of Israel. Aram or Syria. Then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimshi, to be king of Israel, following Ahab, by the way. And anoint Elisha, son of Saphat, from the town of Abel Meholah, to replace you as my prophet. In other words, Elijah, get up. And get back to your task. Get up and get back to what you've been called to do. And he lays out some things that he is meant to do. Now there's more to his story than just this. But God says it's time now to get back to doing what you're called to do. Now there are two main things in all of this that I can see contributing to Elijah's spiritual depression. Uh, the first and most obvious issue is the physical and emotional factor. I mean, try to imagine what he's been through, starting with the long day at Mount Carmel where he was charged so fully adrenalized, and then he runs before the chariot of Ahab 17 miles. That's a marathon. I've never run 17 miles in my life. <laughs> and here he is. We don't know how old a a Elijah was, but... He's old enough to get in front of a chariot and run the way that he does. But the point is, by this time, Elijah is just flat out physically and emotionally exhausted. And very often that can be a factor in our spiritual depression or any depression. One commentator wrote this, Elijah's come down is classic. Over adrenalized, overextended, and emotionally depleted, brooding over his feelings of inadequacy and apparent failure. He collapsed into self pity, withdrawal, and self destructive thoughts. That's the story of Elijah at this point. Now, the second factor in Elijah's depression is the fact that he is now deeply confused and disappointed. And as a result of that, now listen to this, this is very important. As a result of his confusion and disappointment, he's judging himself on the basis of what didn't happen, but he thinks it should have happened. And he's angry. He's confused and frustrated with the ways and the methods of God. And he begins to turn within himself. Let me uh, read something that I came across by David Roper. Uh, he writes about depression. He says, you will often find that disappointment is the main factor 
in producing of despair, melancholy, and depression. We may have high expectations of ourselves, and if we don't measure up, we become disappointed. If we fail, we feel badly about ourselves. Our feelings of worth disappear. We begin to devaluate ourselves, and then we start feeling sorry for ourselves. Self-pity always leads us into the problem of depression. You can see this so clearly in uh, the way Elijah seems to be drifting. And then he adds, Roper adds, or he says we may have these high ideals and expectations of others. And we expect them to respond to us in a particular way. But when they fail to act accordingly, we not only get angry, but we feel within ourselves rejected. We feel a sense of worthlessness, and we end up in this self-pitying, suicidal, and even self-righteous thinking. We then choose to be isolated and withdrawn, and we end up sinking into deeper and deeper despair. What he is describing is exactly the pattern that we can see in this man Elijah since Mount Carmel. I mean here he is, he's all alone, he has isolated himself and by the way he doesn't have to be isolated, doesn't have to be alone but he's chosen this. He has removed himself from all others. He's feeling sorry for himself. He's filled with a sense of self-pity. He feels worthless. He feels rejected without value, without any sense of personal significance. He even expresses a desire to not go on. Lord, I've had enough. Take my life. Do you know something? I have been right there. I went through a season of depression about, I guess, uh, 16 years ago. And I didn't want to live. I really didn't. Now, I'm not talking about suicide. I would never do that. I... I respect and love my family too much. I've seen what suicide can do to a family. Uh, it destroys a family. I would never do that to my family. But I was so depressed, I just wanted to die. Lord, take me. I, I prayed that, and I meant it. I really did. I was just so, so depressed. I, it, you have to be there to explain it. <laughs> I mean, you just can't explain it. It took me a, a long time. I, I would look at something and start crying. I couldn't hold uh, myself in control. It was such a horrible, horrible place to be. And, and a lot of the factors that I see here were factors that were at work in my life. And it can be a very difficult thing to, to have to bear. And, and remember this, God doesn't want Elijah to be here. Nor does he want you, nor does he want me. This is why he says two times, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? He, he's, he's talking about, uh, Elijah, you're not supposed to be in this state I have other plans for you. What are you doing here? Now, the real issue, I think, is how does God get Elijah out of this state, out of this place that he is in, and back to the life that God had called him to? There's a pattern in this text in this story, a pattern of his recovery. The first thing God does is feed him. And put him to rest. He needed sleep. Do you know if, if I've, I've discovered over the years that if someone uh, gets so disoriented and confused, they end up in the psych ward of the hospital, first thing they're going to do is feed you and put you to sleep. <laughs> because very often that's the answer. We're not machines. Our bodies are connected 
to our soul, our spirit, and, and our bodies factor into everything about who we are. So we need that kind of food and rest and, that, uh, and all that goes with that. I, I grew up, let me back up. When I became a Christian, I had a pastor who was my mentor. And he was a true workaholic. He never took a day off, never. And he never took a vacation. His motto was, I would rather burn out than rust out. And that's what I thought it was to be a minister. And so I battled, or I got caught up in that, and I battle it even to this very day, as my wife will tell you. <laughs> and, and all of that contributed to the, the place that I ended up, ended up in, in my own personal life. You have to take care of yourself. And how you think and feel emotionally and how you are spiritually often has a lot to do with how you take care of your, your body. So that's the first thing. The second thing that God will do in Elijah's recovery, he acts in such a way so as to teach him what is necessary to get his spiritual vision back. And in this case, that means an object lesson. And so God has Elijah stand on the mountain, and then God puts on a demonstration. And here, here is that demonstration. He told him, go forth, stand on the mountain before the Lord, Behold, the Lord was passing by. First, there's a great strong wind rending the mountains, breaking in pieces the rock, but the Lord was not in the wind. And the wind, after the wind, the earthquake, but the Lord was not in that earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. And the Lord was in that gentle whisper. As I said, the King James says, there was a still small voice and God was in that voice. Now, what is the message in this visual to Elijah and then to us? What is the message? It's strange, but then not so strange. Frankly, I've read and read and read and thought about this uh, for a couple of weeks, to tell you the truth. And here's my conclusion. God is conveying to Elijah what is the normative way that God will carry out his work. It's in this quiet way he speaks into the hearts of men and women. Now, does God use uh, wind? Of course, the day of Pentecost. Does God use earthquakes? Remember Paul and Silas in the Philippian jail? Does God use fire? Remember the three Hebrew children? So, of course. But that's not the normative. That's not the normative way God works in the hearts and lives of his people. Stephen Ziesler writes about this. He says, God is in the simple speech of the Holy Spirit to our hearts. In the words of Scripture, in a kind touch from a Christian friend. God is in those things. God is present everywhere in the little things. We don't need to have wind and fire and earthquakes in order to be sure that God is present. He is there and when, we, when we're open, he will speak into our heart. I think that's what God is saying to Elijah, frankly. All through this story, all Elijah has seen is the dramatic. Thunder, lightning, uh, fire falling. I mean, everything has been a visual demonstration of the almighty nature of his God. But that's not the normative way that God 
will work. I think this is why all through the New Testament, you will see words like this. He who has an ear, let him hear. Or the question, do you have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying? That's really the issue. Today in the church, we seem to be caught up in, in the need for, for the dramatic. And unless we see the dramatic, we, we don't see God. But God is working in every detail of our life as his children. He's with us. We take him with us everywhere we go. He's involved in our lives and we need to recognize that. We need to see the hand of God through the touch of a friend. Through the word of encouragement that comes to us from a friend. Through a card that you get in the mail. Through any, any expression of kindness. That's God. God is, is at work. We need ears to hear him, eyes to see him. We need to have God in our vision. There is a hymn in the book that we have. The title of it, it's, this is just such a terrific song. Be Thou My Vision. That, that's what I'm talking about here this morning. God as your vision. So that when you look at life, you don't see just life. You see God. You see God's love. You see his, his delight in you. You see God. God is our vision. And we need to have that kind of sight. I'm going to close by showing you a text Psalm 16, this is what it means to have God as your vision. Because David is writing and David's vision is truly God alone. Here's the way it reads. Keep me safe, O God, for I have come to you for refuge. I said to the Lord, you are my master. Every good thing I have comes from you. The godly people in the land are my true heroes. I love that. My heroes used to be those who could swing a bat and throw a football. I love to read now about David Brainerd and John Edwards and George Whitfield and men of God. They are my heroes. I take pleasure in them, he says. Troubles multiply for those who chase after other gods. I will not take part in their sacrifices of blood or even speak the names of their God. Lord, here's vision. Lord, you alone are my inheritance, my cup of blessing. You guard all that is mine. The land you have given me is a pleasant land. What a wonderful inheritance. I will bless the Lord who guides me even at night, my heart instructs me. I know, look at that. I know the Lord is always with me. That's seeing God in your vision. I will not be shaken. In other words, because I see God, I will not be shaken for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and I rejoice my body rests in safety, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. That's a man who has God in his vision. See this, and all of a sudden, all of the simple things of everyday life begin to make sense. They begin to matter. Don't allow your... We, we pray for revival and we want a supernatural outpouring. Oh yes, we, we want that more than anything. But don't lose sight of what you're going through every day as you expect God to move down the road. 
Don't lose sight of the little things that are happening. The way God gently is at work in your heart, speaking to you, training you, teaching you. The way he uses other people to touch you and the way he uses you to touch other people. Don't miss that. It's the little things, the daily routine of life where God is mightily at work in you and in all of the things that you're doing. Don't miss that. Because that's where you're going to find God. Don't miss it. Let's pray.